Hi, everyone. Hello? Oh, is this on? Yeah. It is on? I can't, I can't hear myself. Uh, hi, everyone. I was saying to Emily that this is really bad weather for us. I got caught in the hail. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, if you don't know, my name is Shannon Jackson. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design at UC Berkeley and a professor of rhetoric and a professor of theater, dance, and performance studies with assorted other affiliations. And it's a huge privilege to welcome you to the second iteration of our spring semester uh, around this theme of fact and fiction that is joining uh, so much of what we're thinking about every Monday night. As most of you know, but I'll reiterate it, uh, A plus D curates this series in collaboration with a number of campus organizations, whether it's Berkeley Center for New Media or Art Practice or uh, 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 BAM PFA, obviously, as well as um, a number of Bay Area arts organizations, SFMOMA, Berkeley Rep, uh, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, et cetera. And tonight, and through, uh, we're going, we are going to take forward a theme that we collectively decided to double down on, the theme of fact and fiction. When my, when my collaborators and I uh, began to think about this theme and the reason we decided to alight upon it, we had a lot of different ideas about why. We thought it was a chance to think deeply about the so-called virtual and its relationship to the so-called real. Uh, we thought it was a chance to think deeply about the world of news and information in a pretty politicized climate. And we also thought it was a chance to celebrate how the so-called fictional world of arts and culture help us to un understand the so-called real. Tonight, Amongst the different campus organizations I want to thank, we are indebted to the Department of English, the Art of Writing program at the Townsend Center for the Humanities, the Grad School of Journalism, and a Bay Area collaborator, the Bay Area Art Book Festival, all of whom have helped to co-sponsor this event. And tonight, you could say that we really get to give a particular and specific spin to this theme of fact and fiction, as we have a luminary from the worlds of arts and letters. Emily Nemens, writer, illustrator, editor of the Paris Review, is the seventh editor to take the helm of this uh, storied literary magazine. She's an accomplished writer and editor, as you know, and somebody who's worked in a number of different venues. But in joining the Paris Review as editor in 2008, She's brought a different kind of frame, a different kind of spirit, and we're excited to hear more about that tonight. She'll draw on her own creative practice. She'll draw on the Writers at Work interview series within the Paris Review, and she's going to be bringing some work from contemporary contributors to the stage as well. Wonderfully, and all too appropriately, they're going to mobilize the world of facts, the world of fiction, the world of arts and letters to explore an all too necessary question about gender politics, about equity, about creativity, and about, shall I say it, women's power. <laughs> what does it mean to be a woman at work in the creative arts in 2019? What facts need attention? What fictions need dispelling? How most importantly can those who identify as women and enlightened allies who identify as men use our creative powers to understand and to reimagine the so-called real? Emily has brought together an incredible team, and I'm going to let her introduce more um, as they come up, Shruti Swami, Margaret Ross, and Benita Blackburn, all contributors to the Paris Review. But since this dialogue and what she's put together is really her vision, I'm going to let her do those introductions. But I'm going to let you help me welcome Emily Nemens to the stage. Thank you.
Thank you, Shannon, for that warm introduction. And thank you to everyone at Arts and Design, um, Massimo and Paris, for making me feel so welcome today. It was great to meet students at the School of Journalism and in the English department. Um, thank you to that long list of collaborators who are putting together this exciting series. It's really exciting to be kicking off the, the spring iteration. Um, and thank you to everyone on campus and across the East Bay for making me feel so welcome. The Paris Review is a New York institution. It started in Paris, of course, but um, it, it feels great to be out west and, and celebrating the writing of um, contributors from California and around the globe. Um, uh, to let you know just a little bit about how this evening will go, uh, rather than spending my the entire 90 minutes of the program speaking about my own work and my own perspectives on this topic of women at work, um, I'll spend the first 20 minutes or so talking about um, uh, my remarks, and then I'll do what editors do best, which is sharing the work of remarkable writers. Um, so the evening will be in two parts. My presentation goes about 20, and then we'll welcome um, some contributors. Uh, we're gathering today on the occasion of the publication of the second edition of Women at Work. Um, the second volume came out this winter. The interviews are drawn from the Paris Review's archive, which goes back to the 1950s. Our first interview was published in our first issue in 1953, and um, these volumes are illustrated by uh, Joanna Aviles. Since its founding, I should before we go any farther, I know many of you are familiar with the magazine, which is a great gift, but um, for those who aren't, uh, just a little bit about the Paris Review. Since its founding in 1953, the Paris Review has been the world's preeminent literary quarterly dedicated to the discovery of the best new voices in fiction and poetry. Launched in Paris by Harold L. Humes, Peter and Mathiasen, and George Plimpton, the Review moved its offices to New York City in 1973 Plimpton edited the review from its founding until his death in 2003. Since then, the magazine has been edited by a series of editors, including Bridget Hughes, who went on to uh, found a public space, Philip Gurevich, Lauren Stein, and I started in June. Um, um, a bit about myself and my editorial background. Um, just very briefly, I'm actually a West Coaster. I grew up in Seattle and studied art history and visual arts. and. Um, always thought about literature in the context of the book and the object itself. Um, in my 20s, I was working in New York City in museums, but wanted to engage with literature um, more deeply, so I left the world of um, architecture and went to Louisiana for an MFA. I thought I'd stay six semesters in Louisiana, and I stayed for seven years, largely because of the Southern Review, this publication on the screen. Um, it's a, it was started in 1935 by Robert Penn Warren and Kenneth Brooks, and it has its own and I'd say parallel literary legacy um, of setting the course of letters mid-century, um, needing perhaps an update for the 21st century. Um, there was, when I arrived, there had been four editors in a decade and pretty massive budget cuts. So it was a journal in need of a bit of reinvention. And I was really excited to take that legacy and that challenge and update it to be a more inclusive and ambitious journal, um, understanding that there were about 3,000 previous contributors, but I and I wanted to respect and um, build on those relationships, but also establish a, a new group of, ed, of contributors. And um, I think that the editorial track record I established there, um, there are three stories in this year's um, Best American Short Stories that originally appeared in the Southern Review and two um, from the Southern Review that are in the O. Henry Prize stories, as well as um, a contributor, a, a contribution to Penn America Best Debut Short Stories and the initial um, volume of that anthology um, spoke for itself. So when they were looking for a new editor uh, for the Paris Review, which happened, um, Lauren Stein resigned in late 2017. So that search process actually just began exactly a year ago, um, that record of finding new voices really spoke for itself. Um, all right, so that's a little bit of me. I started in June, so I'm working my third issue um, as editor, just went to the printer last week. Um, and so back to, yay, thanks. Um, so back to Women at Work and these anthologies and what we're speaking about to 
this evening. Um, one of my first pa tasks upon arriving in New York this summer um, was to pick 12 interviews for the second volume of Women at Work. I looked back at the first volume, the table of contents of which is displayed here, um, which was the first book to be issued under um, the new, renewed Paris Review Editions. George started something called Paris Review Editions in the late 60s. It published A Sport in the Pastime, Joy Williams' first novel. It was this great and short-lived imprint that disappeared. Um, it's been a fun and successful publishing experience to experiment to renew um, the Paris Review imprint. And if anyone wants me to go into the weeds of um, self-publishing uh, from our website, I can do that in Q&A. But in short, um, we published Women at Work Volume 1, sold out of it in, in quick measure, and decided to make it a second anthology. So I looked at the first volume and, um, and thought about what which was published in 2017. In its pages, I found Dorothy Parker's um, conversation about her fiction and Claudia Rankine's Art of Poetry interview from 60 years later, reading them and often rereading them, as I was one of a large cadre of writers who turned to the Writers of Work series for advice and inspiration. I considered how to proceed in assembling a companion volume. With that program, the second volume of Women at Work took shape the hardest part to my eye was picking only 12 interviews. Um, as of this summer, 84 interviews and now 86 women have been interviewed in the series and every woman warrants inclusion. Um, nothing's formulaic, of course, but setting a set of parameters did emerge. Um, I wanted it to be an anthological approach, so thinking about the history of the magazine from the earliest interviews um, to contemporary ones, um, women writing across genres and from different perspectives. Ultimately, I um, decided on the 12 presented here, which span from Marianne Moore's 1961 discussion of her poetry to Maxine Grofsky's 2017 conversation about her editorial career, which I'll speak more about in a minute. The second volume represents writers working in the fields of fiction, poetry, and theater, theater and editing. Um, it might be bracketed by two New Yorkers talking about Paris. Um, Moore visited with her mother in 1911, and of course, Maxine was there as the Paris editor for most of a decade. The reader also travels to the quiet plains of Alice Monroe's rural Ontario and the literary salons of Luisa Valenzuela's Buenos Aires childhood. Um, I wanted to focus tonight on just a few contributors. Um, Dorothy Parker was the first woman interviewed to be interviewed in the Writers at Work series. I pulled this quote because I think um, it, there's insight, but humor and humility too. Um, and the intimacy of the Paris Review interviews was established early. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, I think you know, as much as these are very serious documents, there's um, an opportunity and an intimacy in the conversations that are generated with um, within our pages that people are able to take themselves with a grain of salt or three. Um, moving on to the second volume, um, the yellow one, I'll say, um, I wanted to talk about Maya Angelou's interview for just a minute, but I actually, someone else would like to say a bit about it. Welcome everybody. Um, my name is George Plimpton, the editor of the uh, Paris Review, a distinguished literary quarterly, uh, to which you all must subscribe before you can get out of here. Um, <laughs> This is one of a, a series of interviews on the art of, on the craft of uh, writing. It's been a feature of the Paris Review since its very earliest uh, issues. 1953 was when it started. And we are tremendously privileged to have with us as part of the series, uh, Maya Angelou. You all know um, of her. <laughs> Good evening, folks. Thank you. Thank you. My first question is, you once told me that you write lying on a made-up bed with a bottle of sherry 
a dictionary, Roger's thesaurus, yellow pears, an ashtray, a bottle of sherry, I said the bottle of sherry, and a Bible. Yes. What, what is the function of the Bible to begin with? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> the language of all the translations of the Bible are uh, musical, just wonderful. So I read it aloud for the melody of the language of English. So you can transfer that to your own prose. You think your prose has the ring, that particular ring that one would read in the King James Version? Well, I wouldn't say it is exactly, but it's a little like reading Jerry Manley Hopkins. Mm -hmm. You know, really, no. Or reading Poe, or reading Paul Ernst Dunbar, James Weldon Johnson. I want to hear how English sounds mm -hmm. and how Edna St. Vincent Millay heard English. And I want to hear it, mm. so I read it aloud. It is not so that I then can imitate it. It is to remind me what a glorious mm. language mm. it is. And then I try to be particular and uh, even original. And is that why the bottle of sherry is... Uh... Well, that helps, yes. <laughs> the bottle of sherry is in its own way a kind of reward. <laughs> it comes at the end, not at the beginning. Sometimes in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for indulging that slightly longer clip. I wanted to share it for several reasons. Um, one, I think it's so exciting that we have that archival document of the original conversation, which turned into, was edited down into the interview uh, um, with Maya that became that appeared in the magazine is now part of the archive and is now, again, coming out into the world as this book. I think listening to the audio, again, you get the the energy of um, both George and Maya Angelou, but also the spark in the room of the live event and the archival document. Um, you know, a lot of this role as editor is finding new fiction and poetry and great new voices, but there's also a, a really prime role of stewardship and understanding um, this li literary legacy and celebrating it and repurposing it and remixing it into new opportunities. Um, and that clip, uh, particularly with the piano in uh, outro, is from our new podcast. Um, so if you want to hear more, you can, you can find it there. Um, I did want to expand just a little bit on what George was saying um, about the Parish Review interviews. They go back to the very beginning of um, the magazine and they are a, a particular form, and I was talking to the journalism class about this this afternoon. It's not um, strictly journalism nor criticism, but takes a third way, following George's mandate to never think of the interview as a inquisition, but rather as documentations of the author at work. It's a more collaborative tone and was struck, then is struck in your typical interview. After a parish review interview is transcribed, it's heavily edited with the interview subject and editor all weighing in. Um, I think it's a pretty uh, crackpot formula. It was a way early on for the magazine who was, the mandate was to find new fiction and authors readers may never have heard of, but also getting a big name on the front cover so that people would hopefully pick up that magazine and discover everything inside. It's also um, a way into craft and conversations and intimate conversations such as the Parker one about um, practice that might not otherwise be um, accessed or, or shared readily, but something about the, the intimacy of several sessions and the forgiveness of being able to see the work and correct and expand upon it after that initial conversation has opened the doors to many writers' studios and practices. Um, it's not necessarily an easy process. Uh, I was breakfasting with uh, Bob Haas this morning, and he said that his, uh, his transcripts clock in at 180 pages right now. And um, when we're done, we're hoping to get it down to 20 or so. So it is a long process. It's more than just the work of doing the, the research at the outset. But then it's gathering everything together 
um, thinking about what feels the most compelling and editing and distilling that into a really compressed conversation. There's also funny moments of logistical challenges with technology it's gotten a bit better, but I love this quote from Maxine's interview in 2017 about trying to finish up Pablo Neruda's work. Um, there, were, there were several sessions and one of them got lost in the drapery. Um, and so um, she said, you know, George had taken the two-part Pablo Neruda manuscript to Los Angeles where he was staying while working on a film. He wrote me that he had carefully worked on part one and wanted to send it to me, but he couldn't find it. Quote, I fear a Beverly Hills chambermaid either threw it away or took it home to read. Only part two survives, but there's a copy in New York. Followed by, I discovered part one under a goddamn curtain where it had slipped. Um... I wanted to talk a bit more about Maxine's interview because I uh, um, I love this anecdote as well. I thought it was a really powerful moment for Maxine and an important moment in the history of the magazine. Um, this interview w appeared in 2017, so it f took 50 years to share this story, um, and that is a statement in and of itself, but now it is part of the history of the magazine. Um, in short, so she had been working under another editor who had the, the title of Paris Review, uh, the Paris editor. And um, finally, in, um, after another ordeal, um, they came back to Paris and she finally wrote to him in July 66 that she wanted the title and the salary that went with the job. And she asked him for it and she got it. So, so giving voice to that and asking for what she wanted and um, women have been working on the magazine and making a, a big impact on it from the very beginning. And um, just that this finally came to light, um, this story and this p chapter of the history in 2017 was really meaningful. Um, so before we get to uh, our contemporary contributors, I did want to address the fact and the challenge of the Writers at Work series. It's inherently retrospective, featuring middle, late to end of career interviews, looking back on one's writing life. Um, that's the intention, but it also misses important stories about early careers and um, poses an editorial challenge of waiting for writers to mature to the point where they might be ready for a retrospective interview. I'm really glad that we have this intermediate step now of um, it's almost a prequel to the Writers at Work series with our short documentaries called My First Time. It's a way to tap into and share the stories of writers who hopefully one day will be in the series but can't quite be there yet. I'm going to show just the first minute of a video with playwright Katori Hall. Everyone has this moment where they know their purpose. It was when I was taking this acting class, you know, and our teacher had um, paired us up with, you know, a scene partner, and we were supposed to go to the library and find a play that had our type, you know, a scene for two young black women. We, we just couldn't really find anything. So we went back to our teacher and we were like, oh, Becky, can you give us some suggestions? Because um, we just can't find anything for, you know, our type. <laughs> 10 seconds went by, 20 seconds went by, 40 seconds went by, and Becky could not think of a play that had a scene for two young black women. So in that moment, I said to myself, I'm going to write those plays then. My digital director would get very mad at me if I didn't mention that uh, we've recently redesigned, refreshed the website so that videos and podcasts are up top. I think that in the mission of the Parish Review is to bring new literature to new readers and, and celebrate fiction and poetry and all that creative writing can do, but um, also recognizing that in the 21st century, it's not necessarily just an experience of 
of finding and discovering the print magazine, but people are coming to our website. People are engaging with literature in different ways through audio, through video as well. So that's on the website. Um, at that, at this point, you might be scratching your head. I've talked about books. I've talked about podcasts. I've talked about videos. What about the magazine itself? Um, women are at work there too, of course. I, I was looking back through the archive. There weren't any women in issue number one, unfortunately, but issue number two had four, including Adrian Rich. Um, 226, my first that I edited, had an all fiction, uh, all woman fiction lineup, and um, that wasn't necessarily a political gesture. It was because I read several hundred stories, and these were the best I could find. Um, and and then uh, the most recent issue, the current one, 227, has a bounty of poets. I was working with a guest poetry editor, Shane McRae, including this um, wonderful set of women. So at this point, I wanted to pivot. You know, I could talk about contributors and their work. I could talk more about um, the political gesture, but I wanted to do this in conversation um, with what is my favorite thing to do as an editor is give writers I admire new readers and new audiences. So rather than talking about their work, I thought it would be a great opportunity to, to share the stage for a few minutes with uh, several contributors that are here in California. Um, so now I'd like to bring up three young women who have been featured in recent issues. Um, we're lucky that they all call the Bay Area home. Um, there, um, in issue 225, uh, Shruti Swami contributed a story. Shruti's fiction has been included in two O. Henry Prize anthologies, 2016 and 2017. And um, Happy News of Late is her first collection, A House is a Body, is forthcoming from Algonquin Books. She lives in San Francisco. So I'll introduce the three. Um, they'll all read for about five minutes or so, and then we'll head over here to have a conversation about being a woman at work in the Paris Review. Um, uh, following Shruti, uh, Vanita will come up. Vanita Blackburn received the Prairie Schooner Book Prize for Fiction and published a book of stories, Black Jesus and Other Superheroes, in 2017. Uh, last year, she was a finalist for the Penn Bingham Award for debut fiction and a finalist for the Young Lions from the New York Public Library. Um, she's from Compton and uh, recently returned to California to teach at Cal State in Fresno. And finally, Margaret is in that, that bounty of poets in issue number 227. Um, she is the author of A Timeshare from Omnidon. She has received fellowships from the Iowa Writers Workshop, the Fulbright Program, and Yaddo, and her poems have appeared in The New Republic, The New Yorker, and Poem a Day. She's formerly a Stegner Fellow and still teaching at Stanford, where she is a Jones Lecturer. Um, as I said, each woman will read for a few minutes, and then we'll go into a Q&A. So, Shruti, come on up. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for braving the weather to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to read just the first few pages of my story, A House is a Body. Not the scent of the smoke, but the sight of it. Not the sight itself, but the screen through which it altered the sunlight. She couldn't articulate the change exactly. It's just the light seemed odd, like the incorrect light of a nightmare. She had overslept. She was used to waking at the sound of his alarm, risen dazed and blinking into this odd day, the cool yellow morning. Before she woke the girl, she stood on the deck. I have use of my limbs, she thought, without knowing why she thought it, and went back into the house. She dressed the child and combed her hair and shook cereal into a bowl for her. The child seemed not to notice anything at all, still pliant with sleep, and ate without speaking, but with an unfocused concentration she brought to most tasks, that she brought even to her dreams, her face concentrated even in the task of its dreaming, mirroring, perhaps, a dream face that rarely, that rarely smiled. It was too late now to hurry, and the girl ate slowly. The mother had the urge to smack her. She turned her eyes down to her mug of coffee, coffee and took a sip from it. Without milk or sugar, it tasted only of acid, drank, and she was coming awake. Where's daddy today? The girl asked, halfway through the soggy bowl. Went to work early. You know, he might get home late tonight, after you're in bed. I feel funny, said the girl. Funny how? Shrugged. The mother put a testing hand against the silky forehead. You're fine. I feel funny. 
No, she wasn't fine. Her, the forehead was hot. But Jesus God, just a moment alone today of all days. Children made noise, the women had been told, but nobody had ever told her that the noise children made would be intolerable. The noise they made, the sneezing and singing and screaming and shrieking, nothing wrong when she raced to the other room. The child was shrieking with delight and crying, crying, a, sca a scraped knee, a broken doll, the crashing of toys and furniture and bodies. The noise was near constant, slowly growing throughout the waking hours, swelling in the afternoon to an evening crescendo, the noise under everything, diminishing every pure thought and action, the noise she could not quite block out but had to monitor for signs of true distress. Even alone, one child, Christ, imagine two, looking down at the sick daughter. She was small, she was six years old, very small, but turning already, or should she say finally human, with her own thoughts. Dark as her father, darker than him, the mother had not made a mark on her. Okay, stay home with me today. I'll call the school. You go back to bed. I don't want to. You go to school or you go back to, you, you go to school or you go back to bed. No, don't try me right now. The anger in her voice scared her. The girl fled. Annika. She called the school. Something was going around. She was shaking. The anger in her voice sounded like her mother's. Annika? She lay on her bed, still with her school clothes on, and pressed her face into the pillow. Now the mother was gentle and stroked her back. The structure of her rib cage was like hands. Ribs had an affinity with slender fingers. The little body contained a soul. She wasn't crying, but her face was flushed. Come, let's get you. No! Let's get you, Annika, still. For she was squirming, then shivering, as the, woman as the woman lifted the dress over her head and pulled down the tights. Her baby's body gone skinny, the ribs, the dark chest, tiny nipples. Her pajamas were pink, they buttoned. She dressed the girl in them, then tucked the blankets around her. Still cold? She nodded. You'll warm up. Read to me. The same book, one that they could both easily recite by memory, father too. The mother had made herself patient. One winter morning, Peter w woke up and looked out the window. The body beside her was incandescent. She could have been sick the day before and the mother hadn't noticed, maybe even two days. Had she? Three pages and she was dozing. The mother shut the curtains and left the room. Out the window, the sky was lambent, glowing, it seemed, from a diffused source, and she went on the deck to gaze at it. The air felt dry in her throat. The hill sloped away from the house, bare for a mile and then trees, not tall enough to block the view yet, but not tall enough to block the view yet, but they were creeping slowly upward and one day would. A woman re was remembering the hillside when it was green and jeweled with newts bisected with purple and orange, with sideways eyes, cool on the palm, their movements slow with terror. The girl had caught them, delighted. They had lost their tails, she told her mother, if they were caught. Does it hurt? The mother didn't know. What happens to the tail? Does it become a whole, new new a whole new newt? The mother said, maybe. And then the girl's eyes lighting up with understanding. Is that how humans are made too? Baby, the mother had asked, do we have tails? But the rain had not come for months and months and the hillside had browned. Some would say become golden, but she would say brown. And it was not bitterness, but she had felt this way for many years, steady in her hatred of summer. The light was golden, as light should be, but never is. Then she caught the first dark scent. Oh, what now? But the feeling was like wonder. Smoke, she was a body in air. Trudy, that was beautiful. It wasn't for my issue. <laughs> And thank you, Berkeley and Emily, for inviting me. This is really cool. And I've got this tiny story. I'm going to read it in its entirety. So it's only two pages. And it has kind of a, um, a collective narrator, that, a kind of a hive mind. It's a little strange, a little, a little weird to read, too. So bear with me. Fam, my little sister, niece, granddaughter, baby cousin doesn't know she's pretty. So she asked everybody, one post at a time. Her mom showed up at her high school graduation. No one had seen her in eight years. Mothers like that never know how to dress. Too much fake jewelry, fake hair, and a big ass fake leather purse. Still too small for all her shame and addictions to everything else. My little sister, niece, granddaughter, baby cousin went to a costume party dressed as Selena or Madonna or Paula Abdul. Just a thin layer of 1985 draped over her tits. She 
She works out a lot. A pic for the shoulder press, 78 likes. A pic for the deadlifts, 134 likes. Don't get me started on the squats. She doesn't like photos of her when she isn't ready, when her face is the one we see in the mornings, when she can't find her keys or when her phone is silent and black and asleep and dead and she has to wait fidgeting in that space so close to oblivion. They put titanium rods in her back when she was 11 to correct the scoliosis. She used to walk around like a black Quasimodo, loved and gorgeous. The metal worked to undo the snake's spine, only a little pain and constipation from the meds to whip her back straight. Afterward, there came new clothes, new friends, new hobbies, one after another on a conveyor belt, along with the chance to document it all. Her happiness was electric, blinking, a ding, ding, ding. Disappointment is oily. It has hair and musk and cracked lipstick. Her mother never spoke at the graduation, just faded away into the crowd per the court order. They say scoliosis is common in obese girls. The weight on their bird-like skeletons is too much. My little sister, niece, granddaughter, baby cousin was popular. 117 hearts for feeding ice cream to a puppy, 64 LOLs for flipping off the president, 216 likes for a poolside bikini pose at sunset. There are never enough. Of course the monsters came, the trolls with their emoji fangs shooting projectile venom of envy and disgust. We were afraid she would choke to death on the poison like the white girls on TV, hang from closet doors, bleed out into tubs, but my little sister, niece, granddaughter, baby cousin never even said a fuck you, just kept on. When your mother punches you in the chest for reasons too small to see, the rest of the world has a hard time hurting you more. So she smiles into her phone where smiles are brightest, into the light, the wires, the electricity of us who have become everything to her, because in the machine there is no blood, no bone, and no fat. It's so great to get to read with Vanita and Trudy. Um, thanks, Emily, for having me, and thanks, all of you, for coming. I'm going to read um, one poem, Macho. Macho. A man in long shorts had a tiny dog he tossed into the leaves piled at the edge of people's yards, the dog the same brown as the leaves. Too small to bark, it squeaked as it was tossed. I was seeing someone, and we passed it on our way downtown. A street where boys stuck dollar bills over coils of shit, then watched to see who stopped to pick them up, then jeered from the window. They were in college, living together. Girls lived together too, and it was warm enough you could still see them tanning on a roof or in the kiddie pools they dragged to strips of grass along the sidewalk. The dog's name was Macho. I hoped out loud whenever we were walking, we would see it. He found this hope annoying, then pathetic. He said, I think you wish you were that dog. No, I want it. I don't want to be it. I think you want to be it. We were in love. <laughs> or in some other thing love served as cover for. It required constant testing, trying to humiliate while seeming innocent, uninvested. Back then, I didn't understand that everybody did these things choking or pissing on each other, having the girl impersonate a child being molested. You got somewhere, and after, you were where you started. We drove across the river to the discount grocer, where the baggers wore black aprons over buttoned shirts and pushed your cart out to your car for you. Even if you asked them not to, it was mandatory. Next door, the gas station sold souvenirs of itself. <laughs> Lighters and what looked like earring boxes packed with thumb-sized gummy pizzas. Sun touched the river. Complicated trees leaned out at angles to the water. On the radio, a man who made a movie was explaining no one got it. It isn't funny. 
the frozen chicken triggers something for the boy, his realization. Around us stretched the aisles of the fields, then prairie, prairie grasses over whose incessant restlessness the roads and towns were pieced. And far out, moving slow across the earth, black carriages of Mennonites drawn by horses. My job was teaching acting at a middle school. The skinniest of the Sams was most talented. Asked to be an animal, the other children jumped or squawked, but Sam's face hardened to a twitching glare, his paws examining the rug before they crossed it. On the porch, coffee cans preserved summer rain, cigarette butts gone tender, floating. You could smoke and look out at the uncut lawn, down to the snapped stakes of tomato plants he'd smashed when he was angry. It had started with us laughing, lying in the grass, him saying, let me cut off a piece of your scarf to remember today by. No, it started from my only feeling I was myself when I resisted things. I turned away. I felt his scissors in my hair. Late fall, the town put on its festival. Three generations wandering in jerseys, carrying foam fingers. He was house-sitting, and along the wall, some books I knew wore bindings I'd never seen. They belonged together. They were all dark red with notches down their spines. If you debased yourself before a man debased you, then you'd have a little peace. It was a choice then. It was running ahead of the others and standing on the bank where you could see yourself how things went. The ragged progress of the lichen, gnats, a swimming beach, the concrete becoming gravel. I thought that way for years. Thank you to all three of you um, for those beautiful readings. Margaret, I don't think I realized you memorize all your poems. So I'll answer this as well at the end of the group, but I'm wondering if you could all speak to the question of what does it mean to be a woman at work in 2019 as a, as a writer? Well, I mean, I guess I should have seen this question coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that for me, it's a little bit, um, I became a mother this year, so it's become, I've been really interesting. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, I've been, I think I just feels like an honor to be a woman writer. Like I really strongly identify as a woman writer and in this time and also just looking back at that beautiful lineage that you have, that you were talking about, Emily, but it feels to me like an honor and a privilege to be a mother, to be a woman of color and to be a writer. And beyond that, I don't know. I'm, I don't know exactly what it means, but I know that I'm really glad to have the identity that I have. And it, that includes being a woman. And I write very deeply from that identity. I work from that identity. And it's a, it's a privilege to, to be doing that. Okay, cool. I think my answer is might not be as happy as, <laughs> as Rudy. But but there, there of course there there is this privilege, there is this power that comes from writing as a woman because we are in this time and we do realize that when you're, you know, as as a woman there is this kind of this thing, this kind of you know the the, the legacy, the history, but not just of all of the great you know writers, but every stereotype, every sort of you know. Uh, clown boob, you know, caricature of a woman that, that exists in the minds of people that comes before your work. If your name evokes femininity, if anything about you evokes femininity, so you, you sort of have that as a, as a thing to write both through and to write under and around. If that, if your audience has, has is also part of that, you know, that kind of perspective carrying around those kinds of prejudices. I do have this kind of weird thing where I just don't give a damn a lot, so. I kind of <laughs> write for myself, and this is what I tell a lot of my students too, your very first duty is to recognize yourself as your first audience, right? And if, if I'm writing and I'm, I'm not dazzling myself, I'm not LOLing, then 
I might as well just go lay down and play some games on the phone. It's not the the investment is not there. But but once you do that, once you free yourself of sort of writing under all of those you know obstacles, all of that cloud of garbage that exists in the minds of sort of you know other other, then you you are free, and then you are recognizing that kind of privilege I guess that that we do have, and then it gets fun. Right. And but also you still have to, you know, we have to go to those dark places. It has to be dangerous. It has to, in, you know, embrace the sacred, the taboo, all of those things in order to be truly um, compelling, to be truly, you know, worth your time, worth investment in art. So I think all of that is part of, you know, writing as a woman. There's weight there, but there's also a lightness. Is it on? <laughs> okay. Um, OK, so, um, I think about um, gender a lot in terms of being a reader and also um, being a teacher of writing. I teach uh, poetry workshops and creative nonfiction workshops to undergrads um, and making sure that um, I'm assigning and that we're reading together women writers, which feels like it really goes along with um, reading writers of color, reading queer writers. Um, in terms of practice, I. I think that, I mean, women are one group of people that the culture sort of forces to be hyper aware of embodiment, um, the fact of embodiment. And I don't know if that uh, is why I'm interested in rendering um, embodiment on the page, but I think about it a lot. And I think it's something that drew me to poetry initially because poetry is a space in which the physical and sensual life of language is recognized alongside the semantic life. Um, that happens in, you know, famously in rhyme, but in all kinds of echo, um, repetition, um, in prosody, in sort of rhythm and cadence of all kinds. And sometimes I think that those features of poetry are thought to be in the service of beauty um, and I, I don't, I don't actually think that's true. I mean, sometimes they're beautiful, but I really believe that their sort of profound role is to remind us that language is something that originates in a person's mouth or inside of a person's head, um, and that the sort of deepest wish of language is to communicate human feeling and human experience across time and space. Um, That's what I'll say. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I, just to add my perspective, I guess I would answer the question twice, once as a writer and once as an editor. Um, we didn't talk about my creative writing particularly, but I have, um, I write about baseball. I write about, I have a, a book coming out about spring training um, set in Arizona. It's a fictional California team goes um, to Arizona. And as a woman writing about sports, I'm really tired of, that being the first thing you're writing about sports with the eyebrow raise. Um, and I would like to just be a writer writing about sports and, and bringing a new perspective, not a feminine gaze, but just a, a critical one, a, a thoughtful one, someone thinking about the same, something that's been a part of American identity, um, approaching that from a new perspective. Um, as an editor, I think this is a really exciting moment. Um, I'm sure people have seen the graphic of all of the the turnover in, um, in leadership and media um, and how many more women have been elevated to positions of editorial and executive power in, in the media. And that's an exciting thing. It comes with a lot of responsibility. Um, but I also feel pretty privileged. Um, I think I'm, I'm 35 now, I can say that. Um, I, some people think, you know, uh, it's very young. It feels like I've been working in publishing for long enough that this is a, a great opportunity. But I bring up my age particularly because I think I was very fortunate to come of age professionally at a moment where I had really good luck to have a lot of female mentors early on. Um, almost all of my bosses professionally have been women um, that were really um, trailblazing themselves and I, I had a lot of good examples early on um, so that's been a real opportunity for me but it is exciting to see um, women making editorial decisions and 
and finding new writers and different kinds of storytelling. I think that I've always admired and looked to the Parish Review for for new fiction. And one of the things that, um, you know, when you love something deeply, you look and look for for the faults or the lackings. And I felt like um, the register and the range of, of voices and the types of storytelling, um, even the the tenor of the two and tempos of your two stories are so wildly different. Um, and that's one of the most exciting things about fiction for me and about building an anthology every quarter of different kinds of storytelling, different voices, and they're, um, they're all exciting. And I, I want a reader to see them all and then decide which one is most exciting for you and then go pursue that. Um, Margaret, you talked a little bit about building up your pace in your writing and, and how, you, um, how you find your voice and, and the words coming from your head and out into the world. Can um, Shruti and Vanita, can you talk a little bit more about voice and how that's built for the two of you? Well, well, for me, voice is extremely important for me. So if the sentences, if the, the, the speaker, the character, the dialogue is not, you know, interesting, is not there, there's no pattern, there's no rhythm, there's no, and I really love that, that Maya Angelou clip that I've never heard before, um, where she talks about just the, sort of the, the, just enjoying the language, you know, English is hard for the record, <laughs> but it's, um, it's fun and it's nuanced and there is this, you know, there, there are opportunities to sort of change, um, just the, the feeling based on the the pattern of the words, just the, the way they're, they're, you know, just the, the setup, the syntax alone can evoke an emotion and can, can trigger sort of a, a kind of character. And I love that. So without that, I won't even bother with plot. Plot is so secondary. You shouldn't be in my class if you love plot. <laughs> it's, the, <laughs> it's number five on the list, but yeah. Um, I want your answer, uh, a preview of this spring issue. There's um, a Carl Phillips um, art of poetry interview and he talks a lot about syntax in it and how a um, it's a way to control not just the narrative but it's 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 a very powerful tool and there's just power in it um, what what you share first in terms of revealing a subject or a verb or um, um, a description and and presenting that information or withholding it until the end of a line or the end of a paragraph has so much meaning and opportunity. So, And it's a kind of person that thinks like that too. You, 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 you can trigger, you know, it's the psychosis sometimes of, of, of people that uh, just show up in the same way they, they, they speak. So I love that. I love playing with that. Yeah, it's really interesting. Actually, not that long ago was an SAT tutor before they just changed. They changed the SATs and now it sucks. But before they changed it, I was a verbal SAT tutor and I had to I had to get really good at grammar. And we had to you also have to close read these passages and find objective meaning in them that like anybody can agree on. And as a writer, that was incredible training because I understood just it's exactly what you guys are saying. There is just so much power. You have complete control and grammar just really having a deep understanding and even just an intuitive understanding of grammar, but making that conscious, it was just shocking to me to see actually how much, like what a level of control, the words that you use, there are objective meaning you can completely control a reader's experience without them even noticing it just by using syntax and um, and words like really precisely. Um, and all that being said, I think, I mean, like you, I don't really care about plot at all. I am really interested in I actually feel like for me, my writing process, voice is, is extremely important to me. It's the only thing for me, actually, because it feels to me like often I go into a space when I'm really writing something that's kind of almost like prayer, where I ask, I walk into a room, I say, who, like, is there somebody there? Like, what is this? Who's here? And somebody always comes and meets me but I have to be there, I have to be present. And so that voice, I hear it in my head, that sentence actually, that first sentence that opened my story, we worked and worked and worked on that story, uh, on that sentence, because I could hear the rhythm exactly. And even just um, an alteration of like one little clause, it's a very long sentence, just the alteration of one little clause, I could hear that it felt, it felt wrong. It felt really important to me to get that rhythm. Um, so I hear that in my head very clearly. And especially when I'm writing in first person, it's like a kind of thrilling and mysterious thing that happens where it's somebody's voice. I'm hearing somebody's voice when I'm writing. 
And whose voice is that? It's not actually how I talk or even think. It's a different voice. Um, and that's where the story comes. That's where plot, plot comes in. My stories do have plot, but they come by listening, not by me directing them anywhere. I, li I just listen to that voice, and then that voice tells me where I need to go. Um, the voice in all three pieces, uh, um, their gender is involved. Um, is that a conscious decision? Is that a construction? Does that come naturally? Can you talk about gender and, and voice in in your pieces and in, in your in your writing I'm, I'm very uh, invested in sort of the perspectives on femininity and sort of what we're doing with it and also just in, in, in the digital realm and sort of the, how technology is you know in, uh, um, interacting with the sort of state of being so I'm doing that right now I'm also experimenting with that kind of collective hive mind I'm writing more stories within within that kind of thing oh. okay. <laughs> is this better Okay, good. but yeah, I do. Um, I'm really invested in that. But I do write some stories in the masculine, and there, I think they're very biting. It's sort of like, you know, just it's kind of your, you're really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of taking jabs, but I'm also trying to understand something, and I, I find they're, they're often really sad. <laughs> my, uh, my, my male voice stories, but I, most of them are about, um, sort of young, young women and older women, and sort of that inter, the interchange of um, generational trauma that also happens that exists uniquely within being um, being assigned this pr particular gender in this world that must assign genders in order for you to sort of recognize where you will go. So that that dictated path that that had that that were um, were given. And I want to and I have to I have to mess with that. I have to sort of figure it out. I'm always asking questions as I write. So it, it turns into kind of this, you know, this commentary, this criticism, but still this sort of investigation that doesn't always have an answer. But I'll try to, I'll try to put something in there because it has to close, it has to end. But, um, but there is that thing that's, that's ever, ever changing based on all of these other elements that are, that are around us. My answer to that is really short, which is um, I have always written poems, I think, from a woman speaker. I mean, maybe when I began, I didn't think of them that way, but they, when they became more narrative, um, they've so far always been spoken by a woman. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of, I haven't written from a male's perspective in a really, from a masculine perspective in a really long time. I find myself really drawn to women's voices. Um, and I noticed that like, I have some kind of like political feelings about my work that I can kind of like back construct after it's already written and I look at it where I can be like, yeah, I write about women of color a lot. And that is something where it's like, I could say that that's a political thing because I want to, I want to represent myself and I want to represent my world and I want to represent, um, you know, all these voices that have been marginalized. But I think I just feel interested there. That's like, that has energy for me where women's voices and um, brown women's voices. Um, Benita, you talked just a little bit about the generational mm -hmm. aspect of your writing. Um, I I wanted to ask um, Shruti a little bit more. I, there, there's a family in your story, but what does, you know, so much of the Women at Work anthology and so many interviews in this series do talk about um, motherhood and, and how that impacts the life of a writer. Um, not every interview, and I wanted to, when I was building the anthology, I wanted to have different perspectives on that, but not not make it the only perspective. There's there's writers that have families by choice and writers who choose not to, um, but how has your writing life changed? How, how was the family built in that story? I guess, Benita, you could talk about building families in your stories as well, so... How has my writing life changed since I had a baby? Is that what you're asking? Um, a lot. <laughs> it's changed a lot. Um, I actually feel like um, something really radical has shifted for me, not just because I had a baby, but also because I was working on a novel for a really long time. I haven't actually written a story in a really long time. And I just felt I came back to reading short stories recently completely bewildered. Like, I'm not totally sure I understand what a short story is anymore. And I find that a really po exciting position to write in. It's because I feel like the stories that I was raised on and I love, I don't really love them anymore. I feel suspicious of them now. Um, I feel like there is a perspective or there's a kind of aesthetic um, 
a value that's placed on a certain kind of short story um, that's kind of terse and, you know, uh, that all the emotion is subtext in a show don't tell situation. Um, and I feel kind of suspicious of that as being the way to write a short story. And so I feel myself bewildered, perhaps less by the birth of my baby, although I'm quite exhausted, <laughs> but also just because, yeah, I'm really curious to find out what a short story is and what it means. Actually, I really am interested what it means to be a writer, a woman writer writing a short story. What do women's how does my femininity, my body, my perspective shape aesthetically, not just the content of my story, but aesthetically, how does that shape my, my writing? And I really don't know yet, but I'm excited to find out. <laughs> I, I agree. I think that's fascinating. I don't think there are answers to that too, but I am also primarily a short story writer and a woman of color, so I should have an answer for you. I just don't. <laughs> But I, I do love the form, and the form is very different than a novel. I think a, you know, a, a short story to a novel is the same as a poem to a short story. They are different. They, they, they have different demands. And I always think of the novel as kind of this kind of, it's kind of saggy. You know, you, get, you, know, so you can get away with a lot of things in a novel that you cannot with a short story. So, I, but I do like refinement. I think that this, it's the little bit of the Virgo in me that, 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 that does like, you know, the, the being able to trim, being able to sort of have really tight, controlled pieces to the entire thing and being able to see it, you know, clearly and easily with a short story. So I do, I like it for those reasons. And it might be um, a kind of feminine thing. I'm not sure where there's, you know, there, there, there's this need for, for um, kind of, kind of a, a, a cleaner kind of essence searching for that. And it, it can't be, it can't be, you know, you know, bulky and chunky. I, I don't know if these are things that really match up to masculinity and femininity and all that kind of thing, but, but kind of, you know, and, and sort of the training that we have, you know, women, we have to we keep our bodies tight, don't we? We're, we're all of us, all of us here, we're all locked up. You know, dudes are like, <laughs> and I think, I think their story, that was so strange. Like, ah, I, and, I, and I feel their stories are a lot like that sometimes, you know? And I got into a huge argument with a professor um, over James Joyce's The Dead. And I kept saying, I was, I'm like, why is this good? You know? <laughs> and that might be <laughs> deeply, deeply offensive to many people. I mean, and it's fair. I mean, it, prob it probably is a good story. But for me, as, you know, going, you know, going back sort of in, the, in that moment, it wasn't the thing. It, wasn't, it, was, it had no, no energy. It had none of the things that made up my identity, my perspective, my world. It felt so foreign and so loose. It just was, you know, what, what are we doing? I think a lot of that is part of, <laughs> is part of sort of recognizing uh, merit within your own existence. And that's another challenge of being a woman at work is sort of eventually getting to that point where, um, it's okay to have these differences, to have all of these different, you know, you know, um, um, categories and boxes and shapes to things. And one is not there, there is no hierarchy. The hierarchy that we had is inferior, clearly. So, <laughs> so, so now it's time to line things up and create a different kind of spectrum, different kinds of kind of eye. Um, well, I should say happy birthday to James Joyce. It was last weekend. Um, <laughs> He's cool. We're it's, cool. No, it's okay. But I, I do think this is a good opportunity to, to think about the canon, the canon we were taught, um, the canon that we're building for ourselves, um, you know, what a story historically meant um, growing up. For me, it was, it was Joyce. It was um, Chekhov. It was, gratefully, also Alice Munro. Um, but, but what does um, creatively... Um, canonically, what was the canon? What did you have to sort of push against? Were there, I don't want you to, you know, make a list of writers you now hate, but like, were there moments that you found something didn't fit anymore? And how have you sort of rebuilt that, that system of creative mentors and, and writing that you turn to? I know for me, you know, everyone um, for writing and particularly evaluating stories, we were given this sort of very, um, uh, you know, there needs to be an inciting incident. The story starts as late as possible and exits as quickly as possible. And um, for me, a really sprawly, multi-decade world-building story is a lot more exciting than that. Um, and, and thinking about 
time and history and manipulating that, um, you know, fast and slow and sort of a time warp um, is a lot more exciting than, you know, the night that everything changed. And and so for me, when I identified that as a more exciting possibility for short fiction, um, everything got better. But I wonder if there are moments for, for the three of you where what you were looking to no longer stood up and, and what came in. I think um, I relate to the wish for a sort of sprawly poem. Um, maybe that was evident. But um, so there, there are definitely women poets that I have turned to um, in that regard. Um, Marianne Moore is one person. She's actually in one of those interview series. Um, for a sort of uh, messy and like ranging poem that is including too many things. Um, but that's part of what's so lovable and brilliant about it. And then um, more recently, Robin Schiff. Um, then also poems that um, have a kind of, um, that aren't maybe a, uh, afraid of kind of ugly feelings or like, emotional intensity um, that has been really important to me in the poet I um, and um, all of her work is like that um, yeah those three were very sort of transformative I think for the way that I was thinking about poems um, when I was in school we did I weirdly did not think about it at the time, but we mostly were taught and were studying them. Um, and so that's something that I um, I said in the beginning, partially uh, that I think about gender a lot in, as a teacher because I don't wanna duplicate that experience for my students. Well, this is a really complicated question for me, I think. I'm, um, I think that's because there's some, one of the most important influences on my work is now I feel like, I don't know if I could re-enter that. It's painful to me that I don't know if I could re-enter that. And that's because I used to feel myself a literary citizen of the world. I felt like I could enter in any book and it was for me, that I could go anywhere in the canon and that it was one soul to another soul in the privacy of my mind. And in the last probably decade, but definitely in the last five years, I've started to feel hostility to my presence in those books. I don't actually feel like they're for me anymore. And those are specifically books that have been written by white men. It feels really painful to me actually that that's true because I love that freedom and that innocence of just entering the book and being like, we're two souls meeting on this plane and we're in this private communion. But now I think I've been to a number of, I think it's, um, you know, I've been to some literary conferences, I think, where I experienced both like over, there was some overt racism, but there was also kind of an aesthetic racism that I saw where some kinds of stories were being privileged and others were being told they weren't doing it right. Um, and I saw the gatekeepers, I saw the gatekeepers there. I saw where some stories were getting elevated and some stories were getting marginalized. And also obviously the election. Um, all of those things together made me feel like some of these texts that I used to call my friends and my home were maybe not my friends and not my home. And it's to my great loss, you know, that did make me seek out writers of color and, and queer writers, women writers. And that's, that's been a wonderful and really rich reading experience. But um, I really wish I could go back into those books. And like the most profound book I've ever read that shaped my writing completely was reading Proust. And I feel now like I feel so afraid to re-enter that book that changed, I mean, of any book that I've ever encountered really radically changed the way I wrote, I thought, like even I thought, um, because I don't know if it's for me. I want it to be for me. I think that I might get to a place where it isn't so painful to be in a consciousness that might be hostile to me, that I can see what, what they, I could maybe one day go back in a different way of being this soul-to-soul -soul communion 
but right now I can't. It's too painful. Um, so I think I'm I'm looking at the work of women writers really seriously. I'm looking at the work of marginalized writers really seriously, and I'm finding a new way forward. I think there, and it's not to say like white men like are not writing <laughs> like these books aren't worth reading or they aren't absolutely beautiful, stunning, profound, and the canon isn't worthwhile. But just that it isn't my home right now, and that's I feel like I'm in exile a little bit. I, I had a I had a different experience, but um, a lot of that I, I shared. I I remember being conditioned, being taught essentially how to read these books by by, by white men that had that mirrored or sort or sort of you know wanted to reflect my identity, but did it all wrong. So I was sort of taught that it's okay, they're trying, and it's it was just that time, and that's just how how, how they thought. It sort of just, you you looked at it more like history sort of a study of, of, of the, the mind of those kinds of writers at that period versus the literature itself. So I had that kind of dual as kind of, you know, um, education going on. I did go to a school that was primarily uh, people of color. And so I wasn't, I wasn't exposed to the canon sort of in that way. I had great English teachers. I had terrible science teachers, but, but the English teachers were pretty, pretty sharp. So I was exposed to Baldwin really early. So I found, I found a home, you know, I love Giovanni's room early. So I knew these places. I had this, this kind of, you know, old school canon that knew how to speak to me um, in, a, in, a, in a profound way. So it was easier for me to sort of dismiss the, 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 mis, the, the miscommunication moments that I got from the other books that I had to read. And there and there were and there were great moments in those other books. So I I, I just you know we were taught to forget it to, to to forget and to forgive. Now we're not doing that so much. We're in the state of the undoing, right? Just like oh no, that photo you did in 1984 is not it's not cool, and it still reflects who you are today, obviously. So so we're so we're we're doing that. So it's you know we're not we're not going to be as as forgiving. So right now you have to you have to reach that level of enlightenment, that level level of willingness to understand and engage. Um, with everyone, not just the ones that are convenient for you at, at that moment, or trying to you know present some kind of agenda at that moment. So um, I, I did have a, a lot of that going on in, as I was learning how to how to read and sort of understand the canon. I think the the some of the the, the writers that were most traumatic, you know, that I have to I had to sort of back away from. I've lost my entry point to would be you know I don't want to say it, but Juno Diaz, things like that. And David Foster Wallace. So those were sort of, you know, really pivotal, you know, moments of, you know, seeing what was possible in literature. And now, now, you know, going back to that, there's this, there's this taint to it. That's um, that's very real, very, you know, very visceral. But I found so many other writers that I can replace, so it's just really cool. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, and that's what's also fun. It's like, okay, well, let's keep looking. Let's keep digging to see what else is out there. And it's been, it's been an interesting kind of treasure hunt. Do you think that this moment of feeling like you can't go back um, and that we should be interrogating photos from 1984? Um, we should. I mean, that's all true in 2019. Um, as, as writers, as readers, as citizens of the world, um, do you think that this is a moment? Do you think this is a new normal? I mean, I, I, you know, could sort of get into publishing trends, which is a little bit too wonky and not that interesting, I think. But, um, you know, beyond looking at seasons and, and the publishing agenda for spring 2019, what, what do you think will happen next in literature? Well, I did see this photo um, I don't know if it was true. It was a photo, and there were there were sort of there was a, a stack of sort of books that were getting awards or something like that, and there was a huge stack of all, and they were so they were all white men, and there was a little stack for for all white women, and there was sort of little little bit of mini stacks for people of color. So I was like, oh okay, we're not doing as well as we thought, but but at the same time, I I think <laughs> I think we are we are in a trajectory of correcting a lot of things and there is no going back, but there is a huge population that's going to resist that. And they just have to be dragged, you know, kicking and screaming along the way. And it's going to, it's going to be messy and it is messy. It's getting really, you know, all, everything is coming out. Everything, everything is being shown. There's no room for hiding, but we have such a, an amazing spin machine 
in in America and in other nations that are connected to America that 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 make you know anything somehow still seem reasonable. So we're battling with with this whole um, sort of rhetoric and language and truth and sort of manipulation. So we're doing all of that, but I think we're going to come out on the other side of it um, um, better off. I think we are going towards towards a, a more clear understanding of of ourselves and of um, each other. Of, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to sound too suck up Emily, but I think that the very fact, I mean, look at this panel, for example, and you were the like editor of one of the most powerful literary institutions in our country. So yes, things are changing. It's thanks to, you know, it's thanks to people like you, the gatekeepers are changing and the gatekeepers have different, a different perspective and are looking for like are opening are throwing open the gates. It's some of it's happening really slow, but this is, I mean, this is also some of it's happening really quickly and it's well, partially because of you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, that was not a fishing um, question, but um, it does feel exciting. And I mean, one of the exciting things about a quarterly and the nature of, um, of this venture is that we can move quickly and we can think about things and, um, and find new writers. I don't need to worry about the marketing campaign for a big book and an investment, you know, of several thousand, well, tens of thousand dollars, you know, marketing campaign and the, the hardback edition. And in doing that, I can just find writing I love and publish it. Um, I could talk to you guys all night, but I want to get questions from the audience as well because we have about 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, we're going to give up two of our mics and we'll share. Um, Thank you for um, being so honest about what's going on inside your heads when you're writing stories. And um, I have a question. I'm about a generation older than you. So I certainly was raised on white male writers and was aware from a pretty early age that girls learned to identify with Hemingway heroes. Because that was the literature you, you wanted to be Jake, you didn't want to be Brett in The Sun Also Rises. And so it was interesting to me when I went to college and got into feminist scholarship how much women were able to read ma novels by men and identify with the male characters, and how few of my colleagues in the English department were in male colleagues were at all interested in Virginia Woolf. They didn't read her. And so, I wanted to ask you about the audience that you're writing for. So you were writing, you spoke very eloquently about kind of from the inside out your stories, but I'm quite interested in who you think the audience is and whether you think there's been a shift in men being more interested in women writers and in men being more interested in female protagonists is just as women have for a long time been interested in male protagonists. I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, of course, having more more women in, in, in you know, positions of power and teaching and all of that kind of thing. But also we're looking a lot at form sort of lately and sort of and things like that. So if you're dealing with form, if you're looking at just the, the, the stylistic approaches to things um, first, then that means you'll, you'll forget to sort of make all your prejudgments about gender. You'll, know, you'll save that for later. And I think a lot of that, you know, the being being, of course, interesting um, from a formal perspective tricks a lot of the, <laughs> the sexist male readers into actually liking the work and sort of forgetting, oh, oh that's about a little girl. So, so there, there, I think there's a lot of that that's happening in, in classrooms and in, in, in literature where we're, we're no longer conditioned to look at the, the character and sort of all of their situation first. We're looking at the, the style first. We're looking at the quality of the language first. Maybe. Um, I was, I think there's a long way to go on that as well. Um, you know, the, the example is Cheever writing about the suburbs versus um, or domestic dramas as written by men and by women and, and the audience and reception for that. So I think it does have a long way to go. Um, you know, I was heartened by Sigrid Nunez and The Friend and um, and that book and his, its success and um, being about uh, 
a gendered relationship from the woman's perspective, um, but not falling into the stereotypes of gender and and what that relationship was meant to be. Um, so I think it's come a long way in a generation, but it still has a way to go. And, and that is, um, I think it's in the classroom. I think it's in book reviews. I think it's in, you know, even covers and the way that first interaction and impression of a book and when, when someone's encountering um, new fiction for the first time. Hi, this is sort of a self-indulgent question, but um, um, if you could each make one book required reading, which would it be? Um, a very a self-indulgent answer would be um, the collected stories of Deborah Eisenberg. I just think that it's so good. Um, and as someone that cares deeply about the form of short fiction, I think she's a master. And she writes about one story a year. So um, it's a big book, but it's also about four decades of work. Um, so it would be my pick. Um, well, I feel like, am I going to steal it if I say James Baldwin? <laughs> Sorry. I think that, like, the, I, can, I don't think I can really answer that question, except that I would say I would make it from the perspective of somebody who we're not reading enough of right now. Like, I want it to be somebody who is queer. I want it to be somebody who has a different, is differently abled or is a woman or is a person of color or all of the above. I want people to be listening to those stories now more than ever. So I can't necessarily, you know, think of anybody off the top of my head um but I want those I want those stories to be those stories are the canon too they, they need to be part of the canon you know once one book is just so hard you know we're right we, I, I know all of us have at least three that we're reading simultaneously but I mean I mean two one name keeps coming into my mind and I don't know why she's like my enemy but <laughs> but I love her I've only met her like twice but Zadie Smith for some reason I just love her and she doesn't even like white teeth, from what I can gather. And I don't think she likes it anymore. But I love it. Yeah. Look at all those different things. That's fine. Except for the last 100 pages. But don't tell her that. <laughs> but uh, And also, of course, Toni Morrison comes to mind if you really want to scare yourself. So, I mean, just in terms of just craft, language, depth, history, understanding the legacy of the mind of, of nations. You know, you know, beloved will do it. You know, Sula will do it. So you can, you know, you can want those kinds of books. But of course, yeah, I love Giovanni's room. I just, I, one book is just too. <laughs> um, okay, I would add Gwendolyn Brooks Collected, which is called Blacks, and has all of her books of poetry and her novel. So it's really like many books in one book. Um, yeah, but one is very hard. Thank you so much. Um, as an older woman here, I'm, I, I don't know, I'm 60. Um, and I've been, I, I know they're, it's a relative, but I just want to thank you. Your voices are so powerful and strong. And um, I feel honored to be here to, to hear you. Um, I guess my question is, when did you figure out to trust that you were a writer. When when did it finally click? Or how? Because I'm in isolation and I'm writing, but I'm not. I just have so much, but I just, I, I just don't know. I'm just really reaching out. It was it was pretty early for me. I was and I was in denial for my whole life. You know. <laughs> But it was, you know, as an undergrad, I was a major, I was a business major. I think it was a business law major. I was all... What? Yes. It was totally, it was totally stupid. 
but I was I was taking all of these English classes, you know, on the side just for kicks and giggles with Amy Bender of all people, and 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 I was you know just having fun, and I think I thought writing you know was like a hobby, it was just fun, it's something you do on the side, it's not a real career, it's not a job, it's you know it's all of that kind of thing, and I think a lot of that comes from you know pressure from the community to sort of have something respectable that makes money you know right away and all that kind of thing. They teach you right, they teach you, they tell you this that you're going to be poor once you graduate if you get this certain degree, and they say and it's right away you know they, they let you know and I, you know I had to accept that but by my junior year it took that long I, I've said you know what I'm going to just go ahead and do it I'm going to be I'm going to major in English I'm going to try to figure out how to write and then sort of you know support that somehow you know and 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 just and just do that and that's what, and also you have to sort of give up this 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 myth of of J.K. Rowling type you know <laughs> Scottish castles and, and empire of, of money once you let all of that go you <laughs> You can just do the thing. You just write because it's going to happen. And, and it's, it's one of those things that I've been doing since I was, you know, in middle school, just writing strange things. I've always been writing. And I've, and I've never really, I think also when, once you realize that you want someone else to read it, that might be the other thing, you know, when, you're, when you finally become a writer. When you're willing for, you know, to let others, you know, interrogate it and to investigate the thing that you created because you like it so much. So that might be another another thing. So it's, you know, but I, I know, you know, until I die, I will be writing no matter what. If, you, if the whole publishing world just says, I'm done with you, Vanita, just sit down. And I, it, don't, it won't matter. I will still be producing something just because I love it. So I think it's, it's accepting that. I think that nobody's going to come and crown you as a writer. You just have to crown yourself. Like, there's just going to be, I think it, by the time that somebody's like, oh, you have a book, you're a real writer, like, it's too late. You just have to crown yourself as a writer. I mean, I don't, basically, I'm just reiterating, but it really does feel like it's 99% a private work of reading and writing on your own, and then the the sort of public part is just... I mean, for poetry, it's almost not even there, but <laughs> but maybe 1%. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. If you're writing, then you're a writer, I think. Thank you. So um, as a writer, but more importantly, as a mother of two teenage daughters, I wanted to see if you would explore this idea of craft a little bit further, where all of you kind of offhandedly said you like voice more than plot. And what I'm really interested in is if voice for young women or queer or any of us, um, anyone in the oppressed category gets to be led by voice instead of the plots that have been our conditioning over the years, maybe the hero's journey or whatever else, all the success. I wonder if you might just muse what would be possible from there if you're all writing from voice what does that lead us to? Well, if I'm if I'm talking to two teenage girls too, they um, teenage girls actually have a, a superpower when it comes to language, when it comes to communicating, to secrecy, to coding, to all of this, and they can speak English right in front of you, but you will not understand it because. <laughs> Because it's also it's also magical and nuanced, and if and to capture that, if they can recognize that that you know if they can capture that, they have they have mastered something that is quite elusive to to many and also very valuable. So I think it's I think a lot of it is just recognizing that value within the self, and that don't try to imitate anyone else. Imitate structure maybe, imitate plot maybe, just to sort of figure it out. You know, it's, it is formulaic sometimes. And that, and that's, and, you know, so, so it makes it easier when you, when you know what, what you're doing in terms of what, what's going to happen next. But what's hard is voice. And what's, what's amazing is that they already have it. If they can just sort of, you know, just believe that to be true. If anything to add, I actually feel like I ask myself that question every time I'm writing. That's like, that's a question I will never be able to answer because it has a different answer for every story. But that's where, that's the question I'm always starting with. I, I, I would only add an echo that it's always the starting point and that's an exciting opportunity is that there's not a rule of what makes a story. Um, there's not a hero's journey or an arc or a quest or one way of storytelling anymore. And 
um, I think it's just a really exciting moment to to be venturing into that. So um, thank you to the three of you for yeah. joining. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you to Arts and Design.